Hey everyone, it's Mike. Just wanted to offer you a few concluding thoughts from the 5th International Fascia Research Congress in Berlin. Uh, the Congress is over now. Uh, there's actually an osteopathic conference beginning. I can't imagine continuing on. Those two days were so full, my brain is exploding, my heart is overflowing, uh, and now I'm in an Airbnb in a nice hipster neighborhood on a warm, sunny day in Berlin. I'm going to go walking around, see some cafes. I'm excited, but let me give you a few uh, kind of themes that stuck with me for the, for the Congress, and also just a zoomed out view of some of the limitations uh, that still exist in the world of fascia research, because it's not a perfect field by any means. So some themes that stuck with me, you know, I've talked about it a few times, but complex interactions are, I think, the, the name of the game when it comes to medicine in, in the next century. Um, that's to say, it's not this or that thing. It's, uh, it's the two things or the three things or the hundred things uh, interacting with each other to produce emergent behavior. And so when we use terms like biopsychosocial model, um, what we're talking about is that people's macro level experience of pain or dysfunction or optimized performance or range of motion, these are macro behaviors whose subterranean causality is not a single source, it is a, an interaction of elements. And that has been run through the Congress. People are asking more subtle questions about which is the major causal factor at what time and under what circumstances, etc. So we don't have a way of talking about complex systems in medicine very well yet. Um, it's just a meta theme that I think we're just going to need to get better at as a medical community. Um, and that's stuck with me. Um, when it comes to pain and dysfunction, um, inflammation is a theme that ran through the Congress. What upregulates inflammation? What downregulates it? And where does inflammation act? Inflammation acts in the tissue itself. It can act... Uh, as a sort of exudate of uh, nociceptive nerves in the tissue. Um, it can also be acting in the brain um, in relation to dysfunctional tissue. So it turns out that when you have sciatica, for example, not only do you have inflammatory behavior in the tract of the sciatic nerve in the back of the leg, you also have inflammatory behavior in that same brain region um, or the, the brain region that supplies it. So uh, it looks like the brain is communicating with the immune system via, the, you know, basically the glial cells are creating inflammatory behavior in the brain that uh, in some cases at least corresponds to tissue inflammation. Um, how does that interact with other things that seem to causally interact with inflammation, like mood states? Uh, it's a really good question. I don't know. Innervation matters. So much innervation is still really undetermined, especially when it comes to fascial structures. What's the innervation of the spinal ligaments? What's the innervation of the ligamentum flavum and the intertransverse ligaments and the facet capsules? And how exactly does a dorsal ramus nerve wend its way through the various tunnels that exist around the vertebrae? Um, this was a talk, uh, this was covered by Frank Willard and a few others. Um, the path that nerves take is important because it, uh, it can lead to entrapment conditions and it can also help us characterize uh, what someone's peripheral pain pattern is if we can, uh, if we can understand where the nerves are, might be irritated along their course. Um, another theme that's emerging is that, uh, and this, I love this, is just that anatomy is an ongoing story. It's an ongoing science. There will never be a time in human history when we don't have new anatomical insight because we are constantly finding new questions and new frames of mind to ask when we apply the scalpel or the virtual scalpel to the skin. So for example, in this Congress, I learned about a number of new anatomical structures. There will always be new ones, but it's really, uh, it's, it, it's relevant to our treatment. Uh, course. So for example, um, a new anatomical structure coming down from the ASIS in the front of the hip, um, they, call, they were calling them the iliolata ligaments. Medially, these ligaments, uh, they were kind of these longitudinal sheets that were planing off of the ASIS, superficial to the musculature, and they were joining with the fascia lata, that is to say the compartment of the quadriceps muscle. 
But laterally, if you follow them laterally, they're not joining into that deep fascia lata. They are continuous with the ligaments in the skin. So uh, you've got a sort of ligamentous expansion that goes on one level to a deep fascial structure, and then if you follow it more laterally, it, it becomes part of the skin. Why might that be important? Because those ligaments are transversely navigated by the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, which is a lumbar nerve that flows down through the inside of the pelvis and then comes out in the lateral inguinal canal, and then it flows down the sort of lateral anterior leg. So it comes out here, and it flows down here, and spreads out differently in different people, but this is the basic anatomical course. People with anterior hip pain, people with IT band discomfort, probably have some sensitization of that, uh, of that uh, lateral femocutaneous nerve, uh, and its potential entrapment, not just at the inguinal canal, but through some fascial tunnels, uh, distal to the inguinal canal uh, might be really helpful, especially if you've got people with recurrent and recalcitrant uh, discomfort. Um, another theme uh, that's coming out through this Congress is that imaging technology and imaging application is evolving rapidly. The ability to uh, image fascial structures and make inference as to how they might be interacting with people's pathology or, or performance uh, is, is coming up quickly. Keep an eye on this field. It's advanced hugely in the last 11 years since the first Fascia Congress. Um, in particular, look for the application of MRI, um, especially certain weightings of MRI that show you fascial structures with more resolution and contrast. Look at ultrasound, um, both the dynamic ultrasound that you see um, uh, that, that is sort of like looking at moving and sliding structures and analyzing that quantitatively, but also ultrasonogra uh, um, sorry, sonoelastography, which is a, a sort of evolving method of measuring the stiffness of different layers of tissue. Look at just regular old microscopy, but microscopy coupled with different stainings and flor uh, fluorescent stainings that, that show you different proteins on the surfaces of, of microscale structures. Um, this helps us visualize what cell types are and what inflammatory markers are doing, etc. Uh, look at things like histology and confocal microscopy. These are the, the methods that underlaid the whole interstitium thing. Um, Another theme that emerged for the Congress is that, uh, is that if we're serious about things like manual therapy or things like um, anti-inflammatory drugs or things like surgery or things like exercise therapy, um, it turns out that dosage and timing are really important. Depending on when in the healing stage you give someone a certain medication or a certain application of manual therapy or a certain exercise prescription, you may be helping or hindering their inflammatory response and their healing process. So dosage and, and time dependence is something we really haven't figured out yet, and uh, keep an eye on that domain. Um, so those are some big themes. Uh, beautiful talks by Paul Hodges and Frank Willard yesterday. Beautiful afternoon concurrent sessions. Lots of excitement. Lots of big brains colliding in lots of beautiful ways. Um, just a few words on the limitations of this field. Uh, they are many. You know, fascia is a hard tissue and a hard network to study because it is so multifactorial and everyone can map their assumptions onto it and it takes a congress like this uh, and an ongoing community like this to, to help people suss out uh, what is relevant and what can be left aside for the time being. So some limitations that presently exist. First of all, we don't have good outcomes studies right now. We have small scale intervention studies, um, but we don't have a huge amount of randomized control trials. So presented at this Congress was a systematic review of 19 randomized control trials having to do with myofascial release. It's amazing that we have a systematic review of 19 randomized control trials. We were nowhere near that 11 years ago. However, a lot of those randomized control trials had really inadequate methods. They didn't have enough people for, to get a good effect size. They didn't do a good enough job of blinding and eliminating other confounds. Uh, they didn't 
they didn't do follow-up of people post uh, post treatment period, and they didn't do enough to retain people. So, and there's a, a number of other things that lead to high quality outcomes evidence. It's just something we don't yet have in the world of fascia research, and uh, and so keep an eye on the aggregation of more high quality outcomes evidence. Another limitation, it's the big one uh, at these fascia congresses, um, it's no fault of anyone, it's just part of a young science, is we don't have a great capacity uh, in, in the practitioner realm of people who know about research methods. So it's a growing community of people who are both practitioners and researchers, um, but it's still a big limitation. When a researcher stands up and gives a, uh, and gives a talk that has a bunch of p-values and confidence intervals and um, and statistical methods, or you have a talk like Hans Chowdhury in 2007, a three-dimensional mathematical model of the deformation of human fascia, everyone in the audience was like, well, that sounds lovely, but had no ability to critically evaluate the quantitative claims or the mathematical claims. So uh, that's just one example of a whole dearth of familiarity with the quantitative aspect of research um, in the fascia research world that could really help us engage critically with the claims being made. Um, there are a number of other limitations, limitations in funding, limitations in research capacity. Uh, uh, the one limitation that comes to mind is just mechanisms. We have a bunch of interesting phenomena that are happening, but we have a dearth of understanding of how it's happening. What's the mechanism of action? Uh, or let's say this, there's many possible mechanisms. Why is that important? One reason it's important is because if you don't know why an outcome happens, then you, know, you don't know which is the dominant mechanism. Is it uh, viscoelastic change in the fascia? Is it neurophysiologic uh, uh, modulation, some layer of the nervous system changing its behavior? Which of those is a dominant feature predicting the, the outcome that you're seeing? If you don't have that, you don't know which biomarkers, which aspects of human physiology to test for when you begin to build up that research capacity. So zoom out 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Imagine that the world of fascia research has continued to stabilize its paradigm. People are getting clearer and clearer on structures and layers and, and terminology. People have more and more research training. We could be in a world where uh, where people have focused in on certain biomarkers, certain physiologic measures that help us discover the mechanisms that underpin the changes we're seeing under our hands, in our patient's range of motion, experience of performance and pain. And, and in that future, uh, we might be able to really begin to aggregate evidence that matters, aggregate evidence that helps us turn that evidence back into better treatment. When do I do this work? At what pressure? What are the key training things that need to go into my curricula at school? So uh, this is a future that's possible, but it's t it takes a lot of hard work and it takes, as David Hume would say, argument amongst friends. Uh, that's what uh, Hume said truth is, argument amongst friends. So it was a great talk. Uh, uh, it was a great two days. Um, it was closed out by Sasha Chaitow, uh, Leon Chaitow's daughter, um, and just uh, once again uh, paying heed to what a presence Chaitow has been on planet Earth for the years that he was here and, uh, and how inspiring he was to this Congress and instrumental to this community of researchers. So I, I miss Leon, um, and I was so grateful for the, for the Congress. Uh, as an introvert, I'm just looking forward to recharging my brain after so much stimulation. And uh, I'll say one thing, you know what they say about uh, Mexican Coca-Cola, how it's better and stuff. Well, let me tell you, German gummy bears is where it's at. Have a great day. It's a beautiful day in Berlin.